Okay, so today I thought we'd take a little look at the 747, the stock 747 that comes with Microsoft Flight Simulator. When people first start flying Flight Sim, they think, oh, I better start with a Cessna, and you know, there's no way I'd be able to control a 747. So I thought I would dispel some of those fears, and we'll go through setting up a 747 from cold and dark on the tarmac. We'll go and program it all up, get it all started, and we'll fly a manual circuit with it at Edwards Air Force Base. So if we go inside by pressing the end key, you can see there's nothing switched on or powered up. Now, it's kind of, this is a halfway house really, this plane between being a study level plane and a, a very simplified plane. So some of the switches work, some of them don't, and some of them don't work as you'd expect. So the first thing we need to do is turn the power on. So the first thing we do is switch on the battery here, and we turn the standby power to auto and that lights up everything over here. There's a bit of a bug by the look of it and that the fuel pump lights don't come on. Anyway, next thing we do is turn the APU on. So we turn the APU to on, but then we turn it on to start and hold the left mouse button on for a second and then let go. And if you listen carefully in the background, you should be able to hear the APU start up and you will see there's some generator switches here. They will be lit up in a moment saying that the APU is available. So if we just hang on for a moment. If, you, if you're wondering what the APU is, it's the auxiliary power unit. And it's that. There's a small jet engine in the tail that produces electricity. You can hear it spinning up. If we go back in the cockpit now, you can see it says avail on the APU lights up here. So we can now turn the APU on and the, the lights will get dimmer. So cross feeding the power is done for you in the 747 so you don't have to switch from battery to APU generated power. Okay so now the APU is up and running we can go and turn the fuel pumps on. So this is the bit that mystifies me a little bit. I'd have expected to see these light up when you press them but they don't so you just have to be careful to switch them all on properly. Okay, so you plug, switch all of those on. Next thing we do is turn the beacon on. So that's a light on the aircraft. You can see it's over here. So we'll turn it to both. Um, the next thing we do is start the engines up. There's two parts to starting the engines up. You have to first pull out the starter for an engine. And then down here, you flick the switch that starts the engine and if you go and look over here it takes a few seconds for it to start happening actually it might be interesting for you to see outside keep an eye on the engines can you see that one spinning and if you look in here yeah you can see the numbers coming up for the right hand engine now So we have to wait for that to happen and for it to stabilise. So what you're seeing here is the N1 number, which is the turbofan and the exhaust gas temperature, which is the temperature of the air leaving the engine. So you wait for this N1 number to stabilise out a little bit there it goes and now we can go and do number two so we can zoom back out pull out the switch or sorry number th number three I should say we're going to work backwards through them so number three starter is pulled flick number three and we sit and wait again for number three to come up to speed if you want to look outside you'll see number three is now spinning as well as number four and you'll start to see these numbers climb. Yep, so you can see the turbo fan is increasing in speed. And here comes the exhaust gas temperature. So we'll wait for the percentage to come up on the N1. 
You'll notice the exhaust gas temperature raises and then falls down again. Okay, let's go for the next one. So engine number two, pull the starter switch and flick the switch down here. If you look outside, you can see engine number two has started spinning. back inside you can see the N1 number is increasing and the exhaust gas temperature will start to increase any time now. Give it a moment, there it goes. Okay, you can see these um, starter switches fall back in on their own. So as soon as they've fallen back in, you can start the next one, if that makes any sense. So there goes number one, and we can watch, the, watch it from outside again if we want. So we've got all four spinning up, and this one is spinning up to speed, and the fuel flow will come in, and you'll see the exhaust gas temperature raise as soon as it ignites. So as soon as the engines are started, we basically just turn the APU off and then we go and switch the lights on and we're pretty much ready to go at that point. Remember, we haven't done a flight plan. Okay, so engine's up and running and you can see the starter has fallen back in. So up here, you can turn the APU to off And we can go and switch some lights on around the aircraft. So over here we want the beacon is on, we want the nav lights on, we want the strobe lights on. At night you might put the logo on when you're in the airport so people can see the company name of the, air, the um, aircraft. On landing in the evening you would also turn on the landing lights and you've got taxi lights for in the evening as well. Okay, so we're pretty much there. Hydraulic pumps are already on, which is quite interesting that they're, they're all on auto. Uh, okay, so if we go and look outside, with a 747, you're supposed to be, pu be pushed back. So normally the pushback would have happened before the engine start, but we're doing things a bit out of order. So if you press Shift and P, that will cause the, the pushback. So the moment I did it, the truck started moving. Now they will want us to come off the parking brake, although they won't say it. So the parking brake is here. If it's lifted up, it's on. If it's down, it's off. So all we're really asking for them to do is to push us back to the edge of the tarmac. So, or the concrete, I should say. So we'll wait for that to happen. So I don't know if you've ever sat and watched this happen at the airport. They have, um, it's difficult to see from here actually. Should I go from a different view? So this truck, it clamps around the front wheel of the aircraft. and manoeuvres it around. It actually lifts the front of the aircraft a few inches into the air. So we're just let, letting this push back right to the edge of the concrete. Then we press Shift P when we're happy. So that'll do. Oh, I have to do it from inside, I forgot that. When you're in the showcase camera, you can't control it. So, oh, we've got the tyres a little bit dirty there. Or well, not quite. I forgot that. When you're in the, um, the showcase camera, your controls of the aircraft don't work because all the keys are remapped to control the camera. So let's go back inside. Press space to sit up. 
open the engines gently and start using the steering. So while we're taxiing out, we'll put the flaps down as well. So we can either, I've got buttons mapped on the joystick to control the flaps, mainly because the flaps are the other side of the console and you can't get to the lever easily. If you watch carefully, when I extend the flaps, a new part of the display comes on. So I'm going to go for 5 degrees flaps for takeoff. If we go and look outside while we're doing that, you can see parts of the wing are extending and it takes a few seconds for it to happen. Okay, so we're now going to taxi out to runway uh, 22 left. The actual heading of the runway is 20. 225 degrees not 22 but so runway 22 left at Edwards Air Force Base I'm flying this in real time so it's early in the morning over there so the real point of this is to show you that not to be scared of these big jets because although the startup procedure is a little bit onerous we could have just pressed control E and that would have all have happened for us so I just thought it might be interesting for you to see it so the thing that we will probably most likely need to do when we take off is set the heading for the autopilot so it, we don't have to scramble to do it. So 225 degrees. This is the, so it's worth pointing out, this is the MCP master control panel for the autopilot. So this is where you can set the airspeed you would like it to fly at, the heading you would like it to do, the altitude you want it to climb to and the vertical speed to get there. So we're going to go for 5,000 feet. Because remember, oh, something else we can do, I'll do it as a shortcut rather than looking up. If we press B on the keyboard, you saw the altitude change slightly. B has calibrated the um, atmospheric pressure for the altimeter. So it's now accurate to our height above sea level. So we can see we want 2,500 foot above that, so 5,000 feet will be fine. So we're going to change the altitude we aim for to 5,000. Um, we're going to take off 225 degrees. We'll set the vertical speed. We can do it now. So we want to climb at, say, 2,500 feet a minute to get to 5,000 feet, if that makes any sense. So when you set an altitude and a vertical speed, if you're in vertical speed mode, once it has reached the altitude, it will switch from vertical speed to altitude hold mode automatically. We need to arm the auto throttle, but I won't do that until we're traveling down the runway. The auto throttle and the autopilot are separate. So you can see there's the auto pilot over here the switches to switch on and off the auto throttle is a separate thing flight directors there's actually two parts to an autopilot system on a big jet there's the flight director and the autopilot so the flight director works out what the plane should be doing and the autopilot follows that so by switching the flight directors on what you're actually seeing is a visual representation of what the aeroplane thinks the controls should be doing and you get it as these kind of magenta lines on the head-up display. So if you've got the autopilot on it will be chasing those lines. So they're two completely separate systems. One of them is figuring out what to do, the other one's doing it, if that makes sense. Okay, so we're nearly out of the runway. Again, there's a ton of stuff that isn't implemented in this aircraft. It is pretty good, and you can actually go and program a flight in, you know, quite well, into the um, FMC, the Flight Management Computer. It's just not complete. There's lots of things that are either missing or don't work quite as you'd expect. 
just as around the cockpit lots of buttons either don't work at all or just don't work as you'd expect them to. If you're wondering why I'm swinging out so wide you have to remember how long a 747 is. So it's like turning a bus you have to give it some room. Okay we're getting there. full throttle along the runway. We can watch the indicated airspeed. So remember we're just going to fly a manual circuit of Edwards Air Force Base. We will use ILS to guide us on the way into land but we won't actually engage the autopilot to do approach mode or anything. Okay, so rotate we're up, gear up, flaps up, engage the autopilot and engage the auto throttle. So I've let go of the controls now. So you can see it's gone faster than the, the speed will go for 250 knots on our, the speed we would like to do. So you can hear the throttles you can actually see them moving all on their own look. Let's zoom out a little bit to see this happen. So we're climbing out to 5,000 feet at our requested 2,500 feet a minute. It's actually only doing 2,000 feet a minute by the look of it, but that's good anyway. So heading 225, we're going to turn 90 degrees to the left. Okay. five degrees and there it goes and we have to select it by clicking the center of the heading knob so you get a, ch a chance to change the heading before you select it does that make sense so now the aircraft is turning now if we had not set the heading before taking off. As soon as we engage the autopilot it would have gone to try and go to that heading so the auto, you know, the aircraft would suddenly have lurched across the sky. So should we have a look outside and see how we're doing? So there's the airfield that we've just left and the plane should level out now for 135 degrees. So we'll do another 90 degree turn in a moment. Okay, so remember we need to arrange the direction we want to go. Now I'm not having to select it now. Because we've already said we're in we're selecting the heading, if that makes sense. These controls can be really fiddly sometimes. There's some kind of an acceleration as you're changing the, the angle of them. So 250 knots we're still doing. You can see the airfield out over there. If we go and look in little nav map that I've got running alongside, we can see our plot over the ground. So we took off, did a 90 degree turn, another 90 degree turn. So we'll, be, we'll end up on the reciprocal direction and then we'll come in for the ILS. There are all sorts of tricks and games you can play in the um, in the 747. It's got a weather radar and things like that that you don't have in other planes. Obviously there's, there's no weather for the weather radar to see at the moment. It's a bit of a shame. Can we see the terrain radar? 
again there's not much for it to see it's as flat as a pancake out here isn't it If we turn the range up, I wonder if we can get some weather to show up. No, you can see it's absolutely clear. But the terrain radar is showing stuff, which is quite cool. Obviously, you can change the zoom level on that. Obviously, the higher we went, that would flatten out and the colours wouldn't be as pronounced. It's because, actually, you can see there are hills that are starting to encroach on the altitude we're flying at. So there's the airfield. be worth keeping an eye on the, the wind. So the wind is actually pushing us slowly away from the airfield, but not by much. Nothing we need to worry about. So yes, I think the main tip about flying any of the big jets is just to do things methodically and slowly and think through what you're doing. Don't panic or don't try and throw the aeroplane around because you can't. You just have to be kind of, you know, plan ahead and think I need to change the heading, I need to change the altitude. The reason that's shouting that out is obviously the ground is getting closer to underneath of us, so it's 2,500 feet below us. If you look over here, you've got a radio you're seeing um, radio altitude so when you get low enough in the big jets quite a lot of them have radar or radio you know a radio signal that will bounce and tell you how far below the ground is let's have a look at the aeroplane they're very pretty aren't they the planes in flight simulator okay so where are we on the map? Let's have a look. So we could begin our um, 90 degree turn soon, couldn't we? We'll do it so we pass through the beacon as well. It'd be quite nice. Okay, so we want to turn another 90 degrees left. So we're going to go to 335. Three one five, isn't it? Not three twenty five. What am I talking about? Okay, so on this leg, we are going to start slowing down as well. So we just turn the indicated airspeed on the auto throttle down to 200 and you can see the speed is dropping and there's a little marker here for the speed we've selected we're also going to start dropping the flaps so I've gone for flaps one and you can see uh, a marker appears on the indicated airspeed ribbon of the maximum speed for that flap setting so I'm going to go for flaps five as well and you can see the ribbon is changing you can see the pitch of the plane is changing as well because obviously the flaps being pushed out of the wings are rebalancing the aircraft in the air. So going for 10 degrees flaps. Let's go for 180 knots. Go for 20 degrees flaps. And let's have a look at the... So now we've overshot, which is absolutely fine. Because we can show the the discrepancy showing up on the ILS when we turn towards it. So we're going to turn the heading back towards the direction we wanted to go, which was 225, wasn't it? But we're going to have to, obviously we'll have to intersect it, so we'll go for 200 degrees. We'll also go and change this display to approach. And we'll turn off the terrain because we're not interested in seeing that. We haven't tuned the, rate, the um, radio in, so for the navigation, 110.1 for the ILS. So over here, we need to change the 
nav radio. Now, how does it work in this plane? That's a really good question. Have they hidden it in here now? Yes, they have. Let's get rid of the yoke a second. So, what was it? 110.1. We'll just change the course slightly, so 225. And we end up fighting the instruments. 110.1. We put that into the ILS. And this is now lit up. So you can see we're off to the left and we are above the beam. So if we look out the window, we can see that. So let's turn the auto throttle off. Turn the autopilot off. That's fine. Go for full flaps. Gear down. Um, and we're in control. So we're going to steer right to pull this line back into the middle and we're descending quickly to move this little diamond marker is an arrow at the moment meaning it's beyond the edge of the display to get it back into the middle. Yeah. So I kind of I overshot on purpose so you get to see these markers moving. So that will be in the middle when we're in line with the center line. Yeah? So I've overshot again on purpose, you'll see it go the other side. Yeah? So if we chase it, so if we turn back across the runway, back towards the center line, you can see now the diamond is coming in as well. So we're vertically in about the right place. So all we're doing is chasing those lines, the diamond and the line, to about the right place. So we're too low now. So we pull the nose up. And we're about the right place. We're a little bit low. So I can pull the nose up. And then you watch the markers on the runway. And we're down. Okay, so it's quite straightforward really. Once you get close to the runway, you don't look at the ILS anymore. You're using the visual reference of the runway. So we can raise the flaps. We could engage reverse thrust as well if we want to. And you can hear that rumbling away. So if we hit the, the brakes and the reverse thrust, we'll stop quite rapidly. So remove the reverse thrust, and we're rolling. And then we can just start following the taxiway lines. So I did quite a lot quite quickly on the approach. That was really because I didn't plan ahead far enough to show you it methodically. But you, you saw that we were able to switch the ILS on and we could chase the lines down to get in the right place in the sky at the right kind of speed. And the speed is indicated to you on the indicated airspeed ribbon when you select flaps, you know, as to what the limits are for the flap setting you've chosen. Okay, so I'm not going to taxi all the way back. We'll just get it onto this um, taxiway and bring it to a halt. And that will do for the end of this video. But yeah, do have a play with the big jets. They really are not that scary. It's just the thing to familiarise yourself with is how to use the, um, the master control panel for the autopilot. So you've got the auto throttle and the speed selected for it. You've got the heading, you've got the altitude and the vertical speed. And remember to, to set a vertical speed, you have to press vertical speed and you choose it by using the mouse wheel and it will 
follow that vertical speed until it gets to the altitude you've requested and then this will switch off and it will be in altitude hold mode automatically. Um, those are obviously the switches to switch the autopilots on. I disengaged it by pulling the lever down over here. But yeah, go have a fly with the 747. It's actually quite good fun because you you do things a lot more slowly than a big than a sorry than a, a private you know um, general aviation plane. It's a lot. You have to be a lot more methodical and careful, and you do things from a lot further away normally. Normally, you'd start your uh, your approach from 30 miles out, and we came in with like you know nine miles to go completely off course and threw it down onto the runway which just so it shows you can maneuver them like that is probably not advisable <laughs> but there you go anyway that was the 747 in microsoft flight simulator 2020 go have a play with it it's great fun